Hello, I'm Dr. Anil Gudi. I'm a consultant in reproductive medicine, surgery and assisted conception at the Homerton Fertility Center. Uh, today let's talk a bit more about some surgical practices and its impact on ovarian reserve. Or rather, uh, let's look at the common, one of the commonest surgical procedures that we do and look at its impact on the ovarian reserve. The procedure which I'm going to talk to you about is salpingectomy for hydrosalpings. For many years we have believed that if you do a salpingectomy then you decrease ovarian reserve by taking away a certain amount of the blood flow. And through my training and through my job as a consultant we have traditionally followed the same treatment for the hydrosalpings of clipping the fallopian tubes and probably draining the hydrosalpings. Let's look at what research tells us about this procedure. Now this was a meta-analysis done of an ovary reserve after salpingectomy. For long it's been accepted that the salpingectomy should be offered for asymptomatic Hydrosalping. So at least blocking of the tubes is required. There is rising concern that this could be potential damage to the ovarian reserve. And now there is a hypothesis that we impair the blood flow to the ovary. And there are few studies that do demonstrate high vascular indices and resistance in the ovarian blood vessels. We also know that one of the ways of looking at ovarian reserve is by doing AMH tests. 37 studies were identified, 8 were eligible, all underwent a salpingectomy through a laparoscopy which was a commonest route except for two studies which had a laparotomy. Unilateral there were three studies, bilateral five studies and length of follow-up went from three months, four months, six months and 18 months. What do you look at results? And when you look at the results even if there was unilateral salpingectomy or bilateral salpingectomy, there was no significant change in post-operative AMH. And it seems that across looking at both these studies, uh, you know, the group of studies, that in the short term at least, there seems to be the AMH tends to remain steady. Now, let's go a bit further and look into this meta-analysis a bit better. The results to a large extent for somebody who does reproductive medicine and a, and a bit of reproductive surgery, these come as a surprise. One because they traditionally go against our long training. We have traditionally always believed that do not remove the tube. And now this study questions it. There has been a recent long-term study which showed no decrease in AMH up till five years. The data continued to be inconclusive in that study and the age of the participant was much older. So in fact you're not going to see a dramatic drop from AMH from let's say you know, 3 pic a picomolar liter to 2.5 picomolar liter and that is not going to be really very significant. The question now comes up with air and your follicle count seem to be decreased on the side of salpingectomy though the AMH was not. And once again, I will come back to the same diagnosis. Two of these tell us a different story. The AMH tells us one story, a story based on resistance of the follicle and the anterior follicles in conjunction tell you a different story. And I'll keep coming back to you. Step back and use these two measurements to fine-tune and improve your stimulation. It's such a fascinating science that you can't believe. But coming back to this, now what does the study indicate? The study indicates that there is no evidence of short-term compromise through wear and reserve following salpingectomy. It does not mean that long-term may not be compromised. There are limitations to this meta-analysis and there are small number of studies, short duration of follow-up, Variation in surgical practice and AMH was the only reserve 
which was measured, antral follicle was not. And in conclusion, they said salpingectomy should be offered, but you should warn the patient that about the long-term risks of salpingectomy. I wish you the very best. Thank you very much.